Hello and welcome to Nevermind the Bar Charts with myself, Mark Pack. This time, it's also welcome back to political scientist Paula Surridge, who has become a professor since she was last on the show. So welcome and congratulations, Paula. Thank you. One of Paula's other achievements is that in the for the 2019 election, she also became the first woman to ever co-author one of the authoritative Nuffield study volumes on the elections. And as long-term listeners will know from her previous appearances, is an expert on how values influence our political choices. Now, before we get stuck into all of that important stuff, Paula, I can't resist asking, what's it like being a professor? Is the air more rarefied? <laughs> Definitely or the paperwork not. Will no, more intense? I think the... The main thing for me is I, unlike you could self, I, I never did a PhD. So I spent much, much of my career correcting people and saying, no, it's not doctor. <laughs> so I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> that, 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 that's been superseded, which is probably the main benefit for me. That must be quite an unusual achievement then. Is that, um, my, maybe I'm just wrong, but my assumption was that the PhD route was pretty standard for professors. So doubly impressive, doubly impressive that you're a professor now. Yeah, I think it was perhaps slightly less rare 30 years ago when I was starting out. I think it would be virtually impossible to come, come down that route these days. But turning to politics, when you've been on before, and I'll include links to your previous appearances in the show notes for listeners, you've talked particularly about how people's values shape our politics. And certainly at the moment, it's a matter of, shall we say, lively debate between some other political science professors on Twitter about whether politics is a matter of culture wars now or whether it's still primarily a matter of economic issues. So given your own expertise in the role of values, how do you view how British politics is panning out? So I, I always find it quite ironic that having spent kind of the first decade and a half of the 2000s telling people that they really needed to think about this value second dimension of British politics, I seem to have spent an awful lot of time since 2017 saying, yes, but don't forget economics matters too. So it's like caught in this kind of irony of it keeps swinging too far the wrong way. I think the first thing I always say when people ask me this kind of question is that I think of, of economics as a set of values as well. So I think whether or not you want to see an economically more equal society, a bigger state and so on, I think they are types of political values. So I, I kind of don't buy the... The, the very neat line that divides the two in the first place. Um, not all our economic views are um, purely driven by self-interest. In fact, we see some of the strongest um, views in terms of being in favour of redistribution coming from those actually towards the top of the income distribution. It's not necessarily self-interest that's driving that. But then I think where the debate kind of gets even further wrong-headed is in trying to say it's one or the other and for me it's always been about this interplay between the two and it's that interplay that has fr has fragmented our politics and made it much more unpredictable so you've got a really significant slice of the electorate whose in terms of the parties that they could choose from sets of values aren't really represented I'm sure on a previous appearance, we, we must have talked about the left authoritarians and mm. how difficult it is for them to find a party. But likewise, there are those that are kind of centre right on the economy, but perhaps quite liberal in their outlook in terms of social values, perhaps particularly concerned about the environment, who also might find it quite difficult in the current environment to find a party that fits them quite I, well. I mean, it and almost I, sounds like you're describing David Cameron, perhaps, there. Well, certainly, yeah, there's a bunch of voters who felt comfortable um, with David Cameron's um, style of conservatism that that will not feel very comfortable with the kind of announcements that Rishi Sunak's been making this week. So that's, I think, another group of voters to keep an eye on in terms of their values are at odds with the parties they can choose from. And that potentially makes them um, volatile and difficult to predict. I, I wonder if there is a slightly bigger difference or maybe it's actually the same difference in slightly different guys which is that although I can you know, I, it seems to me David Cameron still feels like he's somebody who would be part you know could is part of the Conservative Party they haven't moved that much but the thing that is most different between him and say Rishi Sunak now is the sort of voter they try to be appealing to so we're recording this just after Rishi Sunak's speech about the environment which was all about 
doing less and more slowly, almost the mirror image of David Cameron hugging a husky, trying to persuade people that the Conservatives are serious on the environment. Now Rishi Sunak is trying to pitch the Conservative Party in in, in the opposite way. Now, that may partly be a reflection of a change in cons- the Conservative Party. It may partly be a ch- reflection of a change in the wider world, or it may be a reflection of a change in which voters they're going after and what sort of voter coalition looks plausible. Where And, and I think... That is where values do creep in somewhat, don't they? So what's your sense of which which of the what the balance is between those three in explaining that apparent change in in the Tory leadership direction? It seems to be and and I profess to have no kind of inside track to what Conservative MPs members are thinking at all, but it appears to be driven primarily by that kind of internal party mm. dynamic. There is, of course, a, a, a new dynamic that Cameron certainly at the start wasn't facing, which is a, a challenge on the right. So there's the challenge from um, Reform UK, as they are at the moment, um, which also is partly influencing some of that. And they're trying to kind of shore up, some, bring back some of those voters, shore up some of that support. But it does seem to be a an appeal that will narrow the voting coalition, the kind of not keep on board the... Liberal centre right, the the, the the Cameroons, can we call them that? <laughs> and in that sense, it seems to be a a really kind of core vote strategy <laughs> in terms of making sure that this current poll, in which this week's been a dreadful for the Conservatives, you know, they're consistently now well below thirty percent, and maybe it's a strategy to make sure that doesn't start creeping down to the 20 yeah. percent line yeah i mean the yardstick i often use in my weekly polling newsletter is comparing the tory share of the vote to that which labor got under michael foot in 1983 you know a notoriously heavy defeat that nearly destroyed the labor party it was such a bad defeat and the tories are frequently at or below that level in the polls and when they're above that level they it's a long long time since they've been very much above that level and I, I, I guess it's because of the when there have been polling shocks, you know, in the relatively recent past, like in 2015 or 1992, where a party has done a lot better in the election than perhaps the polls would have led us to expect. Um, and indeed, thinking back actually to 1970 as well, the sort of previous big poll. In all those cases, it's been the Tories who have done the party that's done surprisingly well. And so perhaps there is an understandable nervousness you know or instinct to think well could it really be that bad we you know if we're going to be surprised we're most likely to be surprised by the Tories doing better one would say looking at the history form book rather than be surprised and discover actually the polls were overestimating the Tory support and of course given that they win basically two elections out of three again it's it's maybe not an unreasonable but I do think that just that hasn't even even with all of those you know explanations and considerations that it feels like our politics hasn't really, and our political commentary hasn't really taken on board just how badly the Tories are polling. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of commentary about, you know, this will turn around, this will get better, you know, the don't knows will return home, those kinds of those kinds of lines. And yes, obviously, a number of people have fingers burnt over polling misses in previous years. So, but but we also know that the pollsters have done everything they can to try and correct the biases that were identified at that point. So there's no reason to suppose that that will happen again, particularly. So I think our commentary hasn't really caught up with, you know, quite how bad it is. And I suspect that, you know, there's, we, we haven't come on to by-elections, but I'm, I'm sure your listeners will be more than happy to talk about by-elections. You know, there's a danger, I think, that, the Conservatives squeak some victories in upcoming by-elections that changes the narrative without changing the polling and that we continue to have this kind of, well, it's going to be all right, things will get better for the Conservatives when the polling isn't just isn't indicating that at all. Mm. And I think Rob Ford made an interesting point. He's also been on this podcast before, but he was at a political science conference we were both at recently, where he said that what the Conservatives seem to have been doing is doing increasingly well at getting a higher and higher share of the vote amongst a shrinking part of the electorate. And in the short term, as long as you increase your share of the vote amongst that part of the electorate, even if the size of it is is shrinking, you can overall 
you know, do well. And but it is a short term approach, albeit in this case, the short term can last through quite a few election election cycles. But I thought the interesting point he made was that the wrong conclusion is to therefore assume the Conservatives are doomed because, you know, demographics is destiny based political forecasts have such a horrible track record of being wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong. But the more interesting and the more relevant question is to say, well, given that that's where they're at and that eventually reality will catch up with them, political gravity will pull them down, quite possibly at the next general election. The smart question isn't to say, oh, the Tories are doomed forever, but is to say, how are the Tories going to react to try to then bounce back? Because the historic track record is you know, it's one of the things, perhaps maybe the thing the Conservative Party is the best at, of reinventing itself to suit different political times. So do you do you have a sense of where that, you know, even if it might be, might require one or two electoral cycles to get us, but where that sort of values landscape suggests that a rejuvenated Tory party somewhere down the road might end up pointing towards. Obviously, people like me can dream that they'll have such a disastrous election result that they will you know, disappear from the map of British politics. But if we go for the probably more likely outcome that they will at some point bounce back, so I think it partly depends on how badly they lose. Now I'm kind of making that I've got in my thoughts, I'm making an assumption that they lose and, and I don't necessarily want to hundred percent get behind that. Well, we let's come, come back, back to that in a we, moment. We, we then. come back to that, but depends on, on how badly they lose and how much is left of the conservative party to rebuild and who those people are. Um, everything at the moment points to them kind of, moving tacking kind of further to the right economically after an election or even before an election but but certainly after the election if, if they're looking to rebuild and that I don't think is a winning strategy um for them I don't know if listeners may have seen the British Social Attitudes 40th anniversary report came out today and it shows that the British public are currently in the most economically left-wing position they've been in since about 1983 so tacking to the right at this point would not be a winning strategy. And it wasn't what brought together that very dramatic coalition in 2019. In 2019, they were saying things about economics in terms of levelling up and the discourse around that that were appealing to voters in the, in the centre and centre-left. And, and, and even not... in 1979... It's it's all I always find it fascinating to go back and look at the 79 Tory election campaign for all that we might think that Mrs. Thatcher epitomizes that tacking to the right. And for, for whatever she did after she won that election, their 79 election was very much more, you know, one of moderation and well, dare one even say a, a fairly strong tinge of centrism in what they were saying during the election campaign. Yeah, so so in that sense, I don't think there's I don't think there's much mileage in tacking to the right on economics. Now, the point you're making about kind of um, demographics and destiny is much more about that liberal dimension because that's where we've got this generational replacement of younger, more educated, and therefore usually more liberal generations coming through. And again, that is something that the Conservative Party have got to address. It's it's not something that's unique to British politics. We see it all across different western countries we see these more educated generations generally liberalized and that that can only hold in terms of the, the polarization and appealing to one side of it can only hold for so long at some point that the whole center of gravity of the electorate has shifted and you're going to be on the wrong side of that so where we we, we see kind of economic values as being a bit more reactive and reflecting the economic situation of the time, our our kind of social values tend to be set relatively early on in our life course and don't change very much. So it's not like these these voters that are moving through the electorate are suddenly going to become less liberal, less pro-immigration, less pro-remain and so on. They're, those values are likely to stay fixed and the Conservatives will at some point have to adjust to that. But it may take at least two electoral cycles for that to happen. I am though tempted more. to take the, from the Conservative perspective, optimistic back on that, partly just because so much of what I otherwise say all right tends to be about how doomed the Tories are and you know how badly things are going for them in this Parliament. 
But it's interesting, the way you phrase that does make me think there is a definite cause for conservative optimism because not only do they have this track record of flexibility, but the thing they are most effective at being flexible on is that liberal authoritarian scale. If you think, you know, even, you know, even comparing the current sort of conservative parliamentary party and what they're calling for and so on, and the one under David Cameron, you know, when Cameron was leader, issues like whether gay couples could adopt children were still a cultural flashpoint where many of the Conservative Party were not on the liberal side of that. That became legal. It's become widespread. It's become widely accepted. And even I mean, even people like Ian Duncan Smith, who were opposed, you know, on the wrong side, as it were, of issues like that not very many years ago, when they're bashing current Conservative leaders or calling for a new direction of their party, they're not trying. Yeah, you know, they've already given up on those previous battles that they were fighting. They're not trying to refight. And so the Conservative Party is, in a sense, very good at saying, OK, we lost that that fight will pick a new cultural war issue this time round on more liberal territory than last time but we'll find a new thing to so so maybe they will find it relatively easy once they get to the point of thinking we have to change and appeal to the electorate you know more widely that that what is then required as the next step might be maybe relatively easy for them i hope not <laughs> but it might be it might be it depends i guess on who's left in the party to do that and whether or not they've actually the, the kinds of people that would have been able to do that and perhaps would have joined the party in the past may have found other political homes. And so there might not be that opportunity to change in quite the same way. Well, John Elledge wrote a really good piece, which I'll include a link to in the, the show notes for the New Statesman about just how different politics becomes when who is the party of government changes. Because, you know, at the moment, Corbyn Easter Labour backbenchers get relatively little coverage because they're just not really the story in the way that red wall conservative or you know MPs who are very much into culture wars and the like get lots of coverage if however there was a Labour government those roles would reverse very quickly and in particular if there is a Labour government which likely sees quite a lot of the red wall conservative MPs lose their seats there could be a very big shift in that sense, in the tone. So even though, as you say, the Tories have sort of lost the David Gork type people, if they shed the Lee Anderson voices at the next election, that probably will feel quite, a, well, could feel, depending on what happens in that leadership contest, could feel quite a different Tory party quite quickly. Potentially, but the, the, the kinds of safe seats that we're looking at aren't really occupied by liberal voices. I mean, mm. you're looking at Liz Truss and Suella Braverman. That doesn't strike me as a building block for right. a liberal conservative right. party. Having having flirted with some optimism for the future of the conservative, <laughs> let's let's come back to that 2019 election because we talked about that the last time you were on the show. And you gave basically three reasons for why the Tories won in 2019, which you could very sort of simplify, boil down to Johnson, Corbyn and Brexit. That was the, the trio of, of factors. And now, well, Boris Johnson has left office in disgrace and, you know, polls massively badly in the polls even now. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn exited the political scene. He may make a reappearance as an independent candidate, perhaps for Parliament or for London Mayor, but you know, Keir Starmer is very much not Jeremy Corbyn both in substance and in the public's eyes. And Brexit was, well, the debate now is to what extent is opposing Brexit a vote winner? It's, you know, Brexit, so being a keen supporter of Brexit isn't a vote winner in the way that it was in 2019. So if all three reasons the Tories won in 2019 have gone, I mean, in a way, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that they're polling up, you know, at or just above Michael Foot 1983 levels. But is there a a new combination of factors that you can see coming together that might might yet make everything we've discussed so far far complete nonsense because they they pull off a win at the next election. So I don't think anybody who's written about British politics over the last decade or so would be anything other than cautious in making predictions. <laughs> um, but it feels to me like the British public are at a 
turning point, that they want a change of government. Now, people will say to me, well, yeah, but it's not 1997 and they're not enthusiastic about Starmer. But I don't think at this point that matters all that much. They want a change of government. Yeah. And for most people, if they think about a change of government, they think about a choice between Labour and Conservative. That's that's how they make that choice. I mean, uh, polling recently by YouGov had about 40% of 2019 Conservatives saying that they didn't like Sunak or the Conservative mm -hmm. Party. I mean, those aren't the kind of figures that you just turn around by rowing back on some policies that never existed in the first place. So I think it's very difficult to see a route back. I think the Conservatives are now stuck in a pincer movement whereby they're losing voters who are really pro-immigration to reform UK. They're losing voters who were more economically left-wing to Labour. And then they're potentially losing these centre-right, slightly liberal, more liberal voters to the Lib Dems. And they're just kind of splintering off in all directions but you asked me about a route for winning and I don't I don't see that coming about by a kind of polling attrition where they managed to get a few of the reform UK voters to think again and then they managed to get some of the don't knows back into their I just don't think you could do enough of that with where the and there aren't enough reform I mean the, the thing that as a very crude you know, measure is if you take the reform UK share of the vote in the polls and add it to the Tory standing the Tories go from being at Michael Foot levels of popularity to Ed Miliband levels of popularity. It doesn't. Yeah, it's it still doesn't. yeah, and and they wouldn't get all, win over all of those that, that support. I mean, if you look, it's always hilarious looking in the cross tabs, albeit all the caveats about very <laughs> small samples and so on. You know, the reform is definitely picking up a set of people who are attracted to the word reform and are not, in that sense sort of hardcore UKIP, Nigel Farage, etc. fans. So, but even if the Tories were somehow to scoop them all up, that still just gets them to... Still nowhere near enough. So know. I think the only the only route back is if there is another big shock of the kinds that we have mm. seen over the last five years. So we can't rule them out, but it's hard to see, it's hard to see what they can be. But then sitting here in February 2020, I wouldn't have foreseen COVID. I wouldn't have foreseen Partygate. So there might be something that comes down the track. I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't rule it out 100%. But I don't think it's going to come from a policy announcement from within the Conservative Party. And, and this perhaps explains yeah. Keir Starmer's huge caution in the probably the more likely route of a shock like that is something going wrong for Labour. Something going really wrong for Labour or some big external event that none of us can quite can quite foresee at the moment that, like I say, we've had them come down the track. So I think it's understandable that we might all be a little bit cautious about the fact that something else, something else could happen. So turning now to the Lib Dems, I know lots of my listeners are Lib Dems probably <laughs> thinking, Mark, when are you going to get on to talking about us? So when you were on the podcast after our win in the Tiverton and Honiton parliamentary by-election, you highlighted a question that would be emerging from the party from our success in that by-election of whether we should focus on the sort of remainery heartlands, which in the immediate aftermath of 2019 probably looked like the more promising territory, or whether having one in Tiverton and Honiton, and indeed you know, also in North Shropshire, so areas with very significant levels of leaf support, the party should instead look to pitch for a slightly different you know, range of range of areas that it can win. So now that we've had another year or so since Tiverton and Honiton, and we've had another Lib Dem by-election win down in the southwest in Somerton and Froome, what's your thinking on how the landscape looks for the Lib Dems? So... I think it's a very difficult question for the Lib Dems <laughs> and hopefully you'll be able to work it out at a conference at the weekend. But it's it's you're, you're caught between being a comfortable home for those voters that are, they want to see a change of government, not naturally Labour supporters, letting those voters feel, yes, it's OK to vote for the Lib Dems, but also understandably wanting to be a political party with an agenda and identity. And I think balancing those two things is the challenge at the moment and I think in the current moment the anti-conservative wave seems likely to be able to deliver more seats to parliament because there seems to be that I've talked about it as negative partisanship sometimes it's just like people want rid of the conservatives and in lots of places particularly in the south and southwest in the 
so-called blue wall, the Lib Dems are best placed to benefit from that. So I think my my sort of advice for what it's worth is that actually it's quite sensible to be cautious on those things and be a space that those voters can feel comfortable going to because that's most likely to deliver seats which most likely delivers influence but then that opens up a whole other set of questions for the party to answer about then well maybe that happens maybe that then facilitates a small labor majority what what, how do the Liberal Democrats then position themselves in opposition to that Labour, to that small Labour majority? And what, what would that mean? And it may be that particularly, we've, we've just spoken about Sunak's speech and that kind of rowing back on environmental measures. It may be that actually that opens up a space for the Lib Dems to appeal to those centre, maybe even centre-right economic views, but those who are you know, concerned about the environment, concerned um, about the direction of travel on some some of the other more liberal issues. And it might just open up that space a little bit more for Liberal Democrats. But I think at the moment, I was asked a question about kind of Starmer and the Ming Vars. And I think actually there's a, there's a similar kind of question for the Lib Dems in some respects in that making sure that you can be the home for all those disaffected conservative voters is probably the most important thing right now in terms of being able to win more seats and i think what is different from say the run up to 97 or indeed the run up to 2010 when with david cameron as conservative leader i think with both blair in the run up to 97 and cameron in the run up to 2010 they were pitching to a significant extent for small l liberal votes in a way that i think keir starmer is is doing much much less you know and therefore the potential political space, you know, for the Liberal Democrats in a world of a Labour government feels at the moment like it's going to be much bigger than it was for, say, the Lib Dems in the aftermath of the 97 election, that there is, you know, Starmer is not trying to appeal to the same sorts of voters the Lib Dems are trying to appeal to in anything like the to the same extent that Blair was, other than there is the common factor of, you know, appealing to people who are unhappy with the government, which obviously is always going to be common between opposition parties. But, you know, I'm, I'm, it, it's always risky to rely on your memory, given the way we rewrite our memories to suit what happens subsequently. But it does seem to me now that Starmer is much less of a, of a longer term threat to the Lib Dems than, say, Blair was, or indeed John Smith before him, where there were many more questions about, well, what's just the point of the Lib Dems if you've got Blair? I think it's much clearer we're with Starmer, isn't it? I think so. I think also the political geography is a bit different now as well. And there are a bit more of a sense of sorting in some places, mm. like where it's it's much clearer in most places who the opposition to the Conservatives are at this point. So in that in that sense, that, that changes the dynamic a little bit as well. But I suppose after an election, then it depends to some extent how the Conservatives position as well. If they find their, their kind of small L liberal leader, <laughs> that might make life more difficult. But it's hard to see where that person is coming from in the current in the current political landscape. You did, I noticed, slip in the phrase so-called when referring to the blue wall, which is very reasonable enough to do so. But I just wondered, do you think there's a better way of conceptualising things? You know, the blue wall phrase is doesn't have the sort of academic rigour behind it that the red wall phrase did. And even the red wall phrase is problematic you know, in, in some respects, although also a very smart insight. So yeah, is there a is there a different way of looking at things or different phrase that you would use, or do we just all have to grumpily live with talking about the blue wall? So the problem I have with both phrases is I think it hides voters and it makes us think too much about geography. And I much prefer mm. to think about voters and voters in those places. Um, and in some respects, the two are a mirror of each other because the the issue in the Red Wall for a lot of voters was that they were cross, what I started out talking about at the beginning, these cross-pressured voters who couldn't find a comfortable home. And in some sense, you've got the mirror of that in these other seats where you've got the other cross-pressure and they can't find a sensible home. So if we think about it in terms of the voters rather than in terms of the geography, I think it makes it makes more sense and it makes it easier to think about. And it stops us talking about 
walls that aren't walls and you know and it also stops us from homogenizing these areas and making really stupid assumptions about how people in these different areas are likely to vote and what's likely to appeal to them so I'm just a bit I'm just I mean I'm not a geographer at heart I'm a, I'm a sociologist at heart so I'm always wanting to get down to the people rather than the places um and so I find them just not always the most I, we use them because they're shorthands and people immediately understand what you're talking about or at least immediately think they understand what you're talking about but I, I don't think they're necessarily all that useful um I suppose in in terms of the the blue wall what we're really talking about are seats where there hasn't been much of a tradition for the Labour Party in those areas. So we're talking about parts of the southwest, parts of the southeast, and and so that's the short. That's what that's really a shorthand for. But again, I'm not sure it's beyond making endless, you know, vox pops and and political pieces for newspapers. I'm not sure for analysis they're necessarily hugely helpful. I mean, I always thought that the main problem with the red wall phrase was the word wall because it implied a certain solidity when the whole point about James's analysis was actually these places were a lot more amenable to voting Tory than you might think that although they had a long record of voting Labour when you look at all of these other factors so wall to me always seemed to be to have the wrong connotations about it I do think though there is some value in the blue wall phrase in terms of that sort of sense of you know across things like sort of swathe of the home counties sort of north of London or in places like Surrey that there are places that huge area chunks of the country that have pretty much always voted Tory and where they have started doing really badly in local elections and pretty badly in, you know, things like the Redfield and Wilton Blue Wall tracker polling, you know, so badly in local elections, badly in the, the polls. Obviously, big caveat, not yet doing really badly in a general election, you know, on a large scale. But again, a bit like the Red Wall and the hints of what might be to come in 2017 in the Red Wall. In 2019, you did have results like, say, Daisy Cooper's in St Albans, which is... You know, if we do really well in uh, the Blue Wall at the next election, I'm sure the Nuffield Studies book will make the point about how you could see the precursor, you know, in seats like St Albans the time before, but for all sorts of other reasons, we weren't able to harness that wider opportunity. And just like the Tories with the Red Wall, the Lib Dems with the Blue Wall took two takes to get it right, as it were. So I, th I, I think there is something useful in sort of grouping those seats together, because I do also think there is... Although I take your point about thinking about people, not places, I, I just think when I, you know, like when I was last canvassing in Mid Bedfordshire, the street I was in felt so much like it could have been a street in so many other Lib Dem seats. And, you know, there is a certain similarity, therefore. It'd be, be fun to do a research test, perhaps, with, you know, an online panel showing them street, you know, street views of different seats and see how well people group together. The similar areas but but certainly to me it, it it felt like actually there is something about you know a Lib Dem Tory parliamentary sort of battleground housing estate that feels familiar whether that is one that's in you know in Surrey or that is you know off down in in Somerset or that is that you know off off in Hertfordshire or something you know somewhere like that so so I, th I think I'm not quite fully persuaded by the, the your dismissal of geography but but aren't you proving my point by saying that it, it, the housing estates feel similar in all the places because of the type of voter who lives there so True, but they could... but they feel different from housing estates in other sorts of places so i think there is a there is a geographic difference but you would say that that's all to do with the people being different <laughs> yes indeed <laughs> if you took your street and put it we won't go for South Wales because that's got its own unique thing. But, you know, put it in South Yorkshire. Would it still feel like a Tory Lib Dem marginal because of the types of people that you've taken there? And indeed, to make your help make your point for you, you could argue that's exactly what somewhere like Sheffield Hallam is. You yeah. Know, it, you know, the, the, the surprising outliers on the map, you know, you say, actually, you know, when you walk around them, they look more familiar. And that makes makes your point. I guess, though, it is a there is maybe a slightly stronger sort of geographic argument in that sense in terms of some of the surprising Labour gains 
under Corbyn, where, you know, if Canterbury, if you wander around Canterbury, it doesn't feel like a Yorkshire town. You know, it, it, so they, they did manage under Corbyn in that sense to, to win some seats that weren't just, you know, in a different geographic place from lots of other similar seats that they were used to winning. Yeah, but, but were full of students and people connected to higher education. So maybe yeah, that's a, a particular particular thing yeah. there. So yeah, that, so I'm not. Does does that make it a geographic or a sociological point? Is the presence? I think that makes it a social. Somewhere. Everything's a sociological yeah. point at heart. At heart. Um, <laughs> I do think there'd be an interesting experiment. I don't know. Can we can we get an AI an AI program to look at seats and tell us what the voting would be like? Look, you know, look at sh pictures of streets and predict the voting. Therefore, is that's definitely something worth thinking about as a project. Yeah, I mean, there is, in that sense, I guess, one of the distinguishing factors of the blue wall are what I sometimes slightly tongue-in-cheek say is big houses and bigger potholes, by which I mean it's areas that are definitely affluent, but also areas that are touched in tangible ways by declining public services, a sense of neglect, a sense of the country going in the wrong direction, and that could be potholes in the road it could be sewage in the local river it could be the local school having put on a food bank you know that there's lots of different respects in which wider problems are encroaching on affluent communities in a way that perhaps part of the reason why I say the Tories won in 92 was the degree to which there, there was a big chunk of the country that even through that early 90s recession continued to get better off and was I think much more I insulated, therefore, from from these issues than I think a lot of those blue wall communities are now. Though obviously mm. the proof of that will be, you know, will be in the general election pudding when it comes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so having sort of talked a bit about about the Lib Dems, and you know, given that you spend a lot of time sort of pouring over the details of what what polling says from a more dispassionate attitude or vantage point uh, than mine. What do you think is the most important bit from that evidence that the Lib Dems, people like me, should bear in mind? Or maybe the thing that we most get wrong? So I'm going to give you two answers to this question, because I first wrote an answer to this question thinking about it earlier and realised that it, it wasn't an answer to the question because it was what was wrong. You know, it was the takeaway for all the parties. So I'll give you the takeaway for all the parties and then the specific yeah. Lib Dem ones. And I think the first one is voters are paying much less attention than you think yeah, so take absolutely. the level of attention you're take you're paying to politics and reduce it by a factor of at least 20 to get anywhere close to what normal voters are doing and thinking about you know so twitter last night was awash with discussions of bins if i go out and stand in the supermarket for an hour i'm not going to hear anybody talking about bins unless it's bin day you know it's just not it's not it doesn't cut through that quickly it doesn't cut through in the same way so just voters aren't paying much attention and add to that that they're very volatile and things can if something manages to to cut through and get people's attention like i would argue something like partygate did then it can change things very quickly because voters are quite volatile and then I think the third lesson that I take is that voters are really distrustful. So voters, you know, again, go, come back to this. People keep saying, oh, there's no enthusiasm for Labour. People don't really want a Labour government. But then there's no enthusiasm for, for politics of any kind, really, outside of kind of activist groups. You know, the public are fed up with politics. They've had enough of politics. They just want things to work. Um, and I think that's the, the kind of lesson there. But you want kind of specific things for the Lib Dems because even the Lib Dems can't fix the whole political system by themselves so I think firstly that kind of hangover from the 2010-2015 period seems to have worn off I think that's one lesson the Brexit is much less important now than it was in 2017-2019 so in that's that and that gives both challenges and opportunities in that you can talk about something else and voters won't necessarily be put off by a Brexit position, but it perhaps makes what you can talk about less distinctive. And there's a more general liberal outlook across a whole range of issues, perhaps, than there has been. And that's moving 
in terms of the Lib Democrat, Liberal Democrats take in the right direction. You know, it's becoming more liberal. People have become more polarized on immigration, but overall a little bit more positive. Those kinds of things are starting to move in, in the direction. So in, in the long term, things should look brighter. I think the other thing, actually, I, I didn't I didn't think about this before. It just occurred to me is that the lessons of the by-elections and the local elections are that voters have been quite good at working out if the Lib Dems are best placed to get them what they want, which is rid of their local conservative. And that's likely to mean that Lib Dems are being underestimated in vote intention polls and probably will be even through the campaign, but certainly up to the first few weeks of a campaign. So that's perhaps a a high point to end on that I think pro probably the Lib Dems are being slightly underestimated in polling because they will get concentrated votes in certain areas that will have much more much greater impact than it looks like from a you know a sort of ten percent polling on on a national vote intention. And I think we probably won't know the art what's really happening on that until the election results come in because although in theory MRP models would be a great way of telling that. In practice, they vary massively on how lumpy or uniform they think the Lib Dem vote is, not based on differences in what their poll samples say, but differences in the method methodological choices the MRP modelers make. And so in a way, I think when you see a, a seat number projection come out of an MRP poll, it really tells you more about the modeler than about the poll sample and what the people said it said in that there's a degree to which you know if the, if the number started being 300 Lib Dem seats then that definitely would be reflecting maybe something very wrong with their sample but their sample but you know within you know if if the number is in the sort of the 10 to 60 range you know from disaster to amazingly brilliant that is all I think that's almost all model I when I did say that in a room with some MRP modelers they did frown at me a little bit but actually didn't disagree with the, the fundamental point that it is modelling choices that are a very big determinant of those Lib Dem seat numbers. And therefore, I mean, if I had to guess, I would guess that, you know, say the YouGov MRP model will be closer to the result and the Electoral Calculus MRP model will be further from the result. But, you know, we'll only know for sure uh, when the election results come in. It it. And, and and in that sense, you know, I, I think for pollsters and for political pundits, the, the Liberal Democrat lack of success at recent general elections has kindly made everyone else's lives a little bit easier. Because I, I do think it's a lot harder to project a Lib Dem outcome using polling than it is for Labour or Tory. And obviously, you know, for all of the polling misses there have been, overall the polls are better than just about every pundit you know, in the long but run. I think if the 2017 election was the one that made us all think that, you know, MRPs were the future and the way forward, and that's all we'd ever pay attention to, the 20, we'll go for 2024 for the time being, mm. the 2024 election may well be the one that makes us all go, oh, okay, MRPs are wrong too. <laughs> and even in 2017, there was, you know, the thing that was really lucky for MRP, if one can anthropomorphise it a moment, was the MRP that got so much attention was the one that got it right. And for example, Lord Ashcroft's MRP, which was way off, got hardly any attention. You know, as as I talk about in my in my polling book, you can easily imagine a different world in which the Ashcroft model had got all the attention and the YouGov one hadn't, and would all would have come out of 2017, therefore think if, you know, ignore MRP, load of load of nonsense. And I'm sure MRP would have remade its reputation eventually, but it probably would have been like telephone polling when Telephone polling first happened in, in British elections. It was really poor and so took a long time to get a decent reputation. And then indeed ended up being the gold standard you know, for a while before we all got rid of our landline numbers and uh, the gold standard moved on. So who knows, maybe MRP will become the gold standard at some point. But it it it, it certainly the range of model outcomes at the moment is a good reason for caution, isn't it? I think that the fact that for, for perfectly valid reasons, but the modelling decisions are very opaque. It's it's hard to know exactly what's gone in, exactly how it's been done in, in many cases. Um, and also the fact that as polling in the past was misused by the media, I think MRPs are misused by the media at the moment as well. So it probably needs to go through an iteration of that before we can really start to understand yeah. how it 
should properly be used. There's an interesting challenge for the British Polling Council, you know, the industry self-regulatory body, I think, in that sense, in years to come about what level of transparency is useful and practical and desirable for MRP models. Because I do think the the complexity of the mathematics also means that there's a lot of information that could apparently be giving transparency that would just not really be be very useful. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's our desire to know what's going on at, in an individual seat becomes the problem for the models in that the, the error associated with an individual prediction in an individual seat is is far, far greater than the than the error associated with the full model, which gives us a seat total. Well, um, pollsters so should be arguing for nationalist PR elections then to make their <laughs> life easier. <laughs> but on that note, let's wrap things up. So thank you hugely for your time. Listeners can find Paula on Twitter or X, as we're meant to call it now, at P underscore Surridge. You can find myself on Twitter at Mark Pack or on threads at Mark Pack UK. And do look out in the show notes for follow-up links to what we've discussed and Paula's previous appearances on the show. And of course, if you like listening, please do tell others about this podcast and give it a rating or review in your favourite podcast app. Thank you, everyone, for listening. (music) 